at a number of verses as we get started or passages um, I'll just turn you to them but if you want to start we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 18 so why don't you go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 18 we're only going to look at one verse here which is kind of like the launching verse for a message that I want to give you on the twin themes of pride and humility I know these are worthy each of them uh, to be considered all by themselves. I mean, you know, humility obviously is our goal in life, uh, and pride is that great thing which we would avoid at all costs. It's what swallowed up Lucifer and brought sin into our world as the beginning, you know. So, uh, but um, I, what I want to kind of like do, because this verse here in Proverbs chapter 18 sets them side by side, is sort of co uh, consider the two of them in a connection or in a relationship with each other. And I think we have a basis for doing that here in verse number 12. Proverbs chapter 18, if you will look with me please at verse number 12, it says, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. And before honor is humility. Now, basically, this verse sets forth a fixed spiritual law. Uh, it is impossible for you or I or any other intelligent moral being to live in such a way that this law could ever be violated. And a matter of fact, it really doesn't set forth one law. It sets forth two interrelated laws. Uh, we understand that pride and humility are opposite qualities. We understand that, that pride is something, in, in the book of Proverbs, we read that God hates it. You know, what are the seven things God hates? Well, one of them is a proud heart. And that's what Solomon said. Uh, however, humility, there's something about humility that God finds utterly and irresistibly attractive. 
And so do we, if we're quite honest with ourselves. When we see somebody that walks in a spirit of pride, there is something that, you know, instinctively we say that person is full of themselves. That person, that, that doesn't, you know, it is not attractive to us at all. But humility, it always is. Now, what this uh, verse basically says is it says, you know, the first phrase is that God will ultimately, he will visit the proud of heart with destruction and he will visit the humble of heart with honor and so we see these two things as like an ultimatum you know we have a choice to make and the choice is how our heart is going to be constituted before him and once we make and live our choice and are confirmed in a lifestyle that's characterized by pride or a lifestyle that strains after humility God in heaven on some day he will reward us appropriately. Now, this first phrase, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. What I want to do here is I want to illustrate that by what I would believe to be the greatest example that we can find of it in the Bible. And then we're going to go to the second phrase, before honor is, hum is humility. And I want to illustrate that likewise with another portion of Scripture that sets it forth as plainly and perfectly as we can possibly see it. So for the first clause, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And here we're going to see pride in its ultimate manifestation, and what becomes of it. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, and the passage is well known. We're going to begin reading at verse number 12. Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer! Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Now, some of you might not have heard of that name, Lucifer. I, I trust most of you have, but Lucifer is the name of a cherubic class of angel, and it was the highest of the cherubim that God had made. So it sat in this place of special connection with the throne of God, and uh, it's talking about his falling. And this was, in fact, the very first angel that ever fell. We now commonly know his name is Satan, the adversary. He is the accuser, the deceiver, the arch enemy of God and our souls. But before he was that, he was Lucifer, son of the morning, a bright, shining, glorious angel. And it says, you have, he says, you've said in your heart, now how an angel can get into this condition, but look at the pride you see in these, these escalating I will statements. You'll see a kind of a madness building up in them. He says, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend upon the, above the heights of the clouds. And the top note, I will be like the Most High. And God says, yet you shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. You know, we're going to see that happen. Um, I can almost take those five I wills as Satan's agenda for the age that we are now living in. He wants to capture the worship of the world. And in the tribulation period, he will be allowed to capture the worship of the world. And when will he be cast into that pit, uh, the sides of the pit? That will be there at the very beginning of the millennial period. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at... Uh, Philippians chapter, Philippians chapter 2. So what we, we saw that that first clause, right, before, you know, destruction, the heart of man is haughty, uh, that was illustrated by Satan. Now if you look in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to have uh, the, the second clause illustrated. And here's humility and how humility relates to God quite differently. What humility does, 
what humility thinks, how humility acts, and, and more importantly, what reaction God has to humility. The destiny could not be more opposite. So in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to see Christ described in verse number 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, so as Jesus was in this world, as impossible as it may sound, we are to be likewise. That is the Christian goal, by the way. We are to become like Christ. It's going to take all of this life, and uh, not until we, we're glorified will we actually get there. But nonetheless, that is our target objective in this world, to be like him. And what was he like? Look at verse 6. Who being... In the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, here's one that actually was equal with God. He, he, he was one with the Most High and always had been. He was the Most High, uh, the second member of the Trinity, but he had a different animating spirit within his heart. And so we begin to see a different set of actions unfold out of him. In his, when he came down incarnate, he was in a relationship and a role before his father where he, in order to do the divine will, took a subordinate role. And we see that Jesus Christ, he surrendered to it in an attitude of humility. So this is what humility looks like. It says in verse 7, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant and he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. You know, we see there in the life, obviously, of Jesus Christ, the ultimate uh, example of humility. So right now what I can do is I can say that Satan, on the one hand, stands for pride at its utmost. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, we've looked at two passages that shows what humility ultimately finally can be. And those two, they stand as what we might call the antipodes of the moral universe, the extreme opposites of what is morally possible in this world. And uh, I wanted to just observe a few things about pride and humility as we consider the two of them together. Uh, number one, pride and humility consist, think about this, in what we think about ourselves. So this all of a sudden is going to get very, very basic, and it applies to every single one of this. You want to know the essence of what constitutes pride or on the other hand, what constitutes humility, either one of those two things, it has to do with what we think in our hearts. Before, uh, the, it, it said in there in um, Proverbs chapter 18, remember this, it says, um, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, right? Before honor, his heart is, is humble. And so humility and, and pride, they're both, uh, they're, they're found in the heart. They're in the thoughts of mankind, and, and specifically, if you wanted to narrow it down to what it actually is, it's this. Pride, is that's what causes a man to think more highly of himself than what he ought to think. We speak of someone who has pride as having an inflated opinion, that he's puffed up in some way. And you couldn't think of a, a better example of that than, than Lucifer himself. But humility, on the other hand, that leads a man to form a just and true opinion of himself, a right self-estimate. And, um, you know, uh, self-deprecation, some people might, there, there's kind of like mistaken forms of humility out there. But a self-deprecation, that's in no ways to be taken as a form of humility at all. As a matter of fact, that's just an inverse form of pride. What humility is, is humility is a full-hearted embrace of the entire truth. A man looking at himself and seeing himself and confessing himself to be exactly what he is, with no exaggeration, whether positive or negative. And, um, you know, here, it, this is an important thing because all of our thoughts are before the Lord. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. <clears throat> 
Proverbs chapter 15. And if you look there in verse number 11, we're going to find out that, you know, the Lord cares about what we think. As a matter of fact, when he, he, he's constantly looking down, the Bible says his eyelids try the children of men. He studies our hearts. He, he knows all the secrets of our hearts. Someday he will judge all the secrets of our hearts. And uh, so in, in verse number 11 it is, it says, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. Well, how much more than the hearts of the children of men? God, you know, with Jesus Christ, he said in, in Revelation chapter 2, he says, I am he that searches the hearts and the minds, right? And why does he do that? Is because he's the judge too. He searches the hearts and minds because someday he's going to give to every one of us according to our works. And uh, th therefore, he, he looks to what we are inside. Now, listen, men can't do that. You know, um, we can't really study the heart of another person. We look upon the outside, the external appearance, and we can form judgments or assessments of what we might think is going on inside of another person, but we really don't know. Um, and probably every one of you have had the experience of being misjudged by someone, that somebody was looking upon you and they were calculating on what they saw of you and then all of a sudden make an inference in their own mind. What you must be thinking or why you must be doing what you're doing. Only they got it all wrong because you know what? People and the devil too, they can't really look in our hearts. God does. He says, I am he that looks upon. As a matter of fact, to be honest with you, we can't even fully understand our own hearts. If you'll turn to Jeremiah chapter 17, let me show you something there in Jeremiah 17. God only is he that can understand all the truth in our hearts, including the whole issue and matter about, um, you know, the place of pride and the place of humility in our motives and in our doings. And Jeremiah chapter 17, look at, um, look at verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And he asks a question, who can know it? And the truth of the matter is, there's nobody that can fully know the heart of man, not even the man that has it quite like God can. God knows our hearts better than we know them because, well, God's not liable to deception. And we are liable to self-deception. That's what he means in verse 9 when he says, you know, the heart is deceitful. People can be deceived by their own inward heart. And we look around and we see that that is commonplace in the world today. There's a lot of people that are in a deceived state because they don't know their own heart. But God goes on in verse number 10. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try, I test their mind, their thoughts, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So pride and humility, they consist in what we think about ourselves. And between the two, they, here's the second point, that between the two, they compromise a spectrum of possible spiritual health. Um, let me put it this way. None of us live in a perfect spiritual state. We have, by the blessing of God, we've received a perfect salvation. But even though I have a perfect salvation, thanks and glory to God, I can't claim a, a spiritual perfection or Christian perfection in my life right now, nor can you. As a matter of fact, none of us can claim to have a constant spiritual state. We're always waxing and waning. There is a vacillation in our spiritual experience. So if we were to locate just exactly where we are, spiritually speaking, in terms of like we're, we're towards the Christ end of the spectrum, where all of a sudden we're living in a likeness to Jesus Christ, you know, or if we've gone to the other end where we're following the opposite father in the opposite direction, all of a sudden when we look at this whole business of pride on the one hand and humility on the other, we have such a spectrum set down in front of us. And to be honest with you, every man, woman, and child in the world will be somewhere in the middle. None of us can claim equality with Jesus Christ. 
That's not possible in this world. None of us are so bad as the devil. Obviously, everybody. And it doesn't even matter whether or not you're saved or lost. All of us are somewhere in the middle. And, you know, we have to go ahead and evaluate carefully where we are by looking at that spectrum. Um, but let me sh share just a couple of things. First of all, there is short-term fluctuation in that, you know... Um, my state can change from day to day or hour to hour because of situation and events. My mood can alter. But then there's also long-term uh, changes that can happen in, in, in terms of a man's character, in terms of the choices that he makes, the habits that he forms in life. It took a long time, for example, for there to be a Caiaphas or an Annas. Uh, Children, if you look at the if you look at the lives of children, they can be quickly moved to selfishness, and they can be very quickly moved to tender heartedness as well. You see both pride and uh, uh, and humility, and they're and they're in a, in a child very responsive and quick to flash out. But what happens when people begin to get older and older? They make choices. They have habit patterns in their lives, and sooner or later, a character begins to be formed. Now, the good news, and I just wanted to kind of share this, is that it is possible for there to be abrupt changes in this whole spectrum. It is possible for a person that has lived a life characterized by pride to suddenly come back around to humility in a way of conversion. One of my favorite uh, parables Christ told, it's in Luke 18. Why don't you turn to Luke 18. In Luke chapter 18, we see there, and I'll begin reading in verse number 10. And, and Christ is speaking to some people that are kind of asking him about matters very much like this. And uh, in Luke 18.10, Christ says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. I'm not, you know, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. And then the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift uh, much as lift his eyes unto heaven, but he smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you that this man, the publican, he went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. When you look there at the end of verse 14, you really see the exact same principle that we just read in, in Proverbs 18, don't you? You see that? Everyone that exalts himself, pride, that person will come in time to a place of abasement. And the opposite is also true, the inverse. The one that lives for the sake of humility and like Christ humbles his own soul shall eventually be exalted or come to a place of promotion. And what was interesting about this publican right here is by his own admission, he had lived a life in which he was a proud man. He was an ungodly sort of person. But the Holy Spirit working in his heart and working in his life brought him to a place where he began to appreciate, to see, to realize the truth about himself. And there was a conviction going on. And you know, that's the marvelous thing about Christianity. A person cannot get so old and, and be so far that they cannot be reached by the grace of God. And, and, and a life can be lived a long time for wrong principles in a totally worldly way. And yet if the Holy Spirit gets a hold of the person and they receive the truth about themselves, all of a sudden they begin to self-identify identify for what they really are. And they can say to themselves, you know what? I failed. I, I am a sinner. I, I, I don't deserve heaven. I don't merit what God would have made me to be. And he is good. And, if, and, you know, you embrace that. We call that a breaking, right? That's when the heart or the soul breaks before the Lord. And we also call it a conversion. It's when all of a sudden we change our minds in a major, in a profound way. We change our minds and we embrace truth. And when we get back to truth like that, we can be refreshed in an instant. And I tell you what. 
people that have lived a long time in a wrong way, they can be converted and rebound so extremely with gratitude and, and joy in their heart that it's like all of a sudden they swing to the opposite end of the spectrum really, really fast. And we can see that happen. But I got to give you a warning, too, because it is also possible. We, we saints, we're not out of the spectrum. And, and it is possible, very possible, in fact, for saints when they, they come to be exalted to stumble and fall. And to be honest with you, over the course of my life, um, I, I recall a number of high-profile Christians, those that have gotten very, very, well, they, they were, they were high-profile Christians in this world. They, they received a measure of exaltation, and many of them, when they got to that place, they actually fell. You know, and um, I, I'm, there was one guy that uh, came to Midwestern. He was a very high-profile preacher. Um, Jack Hiles was his name. You know that. Um, and I'm not his judge, but, you know, he, there's one example of a person that became very high in the world, and somehow things got into the heart, and there was a, and I can name a lot of others. I, there was a guy, very high-profile guy, that committed suicide because he couldn't efface what he did. There was another guy that took off to, to Germany to become a missionary to try to escape the consequences of what he did. There was a guy here in the news not all that long ago, and I don't know if what they're saying about that fella is true or not, but what I'm saying is that even the Apostle Paul said, you know what, I've recognized it in my soul. There is a tendency. My default state is not for humility. Boy, that comes in with grace. My default state, what we are by nature, runs in the direction of pride, the same way the world does. And Paul says, I, I have to buffet my body. I have to live with a disciplined effort to keep even myself from falling. The Apostle Paul realized that it was possible for him to become a ministry castaway. And uh, so... You know, that's one of those things that we need to remember. What I always do is I claim that promise in Jude. There is a promise in Jude that says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy. The Lord is able to keep us from falling. Now, a third thing that I'll go ahead and I'll mention here. Pride and humility they, they are in themselves, they're preludes to a coming judgment. If, if you turn back, if you will, please, to where we began. Turn all the way back. I want you to take a closer look now at Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 12. Proverbs 18 and verse number 12. You'll notice that word before occurs twice, and it has reference to before in time, right? Before destruction the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. You know, there's an old saying that coming events cast their shadows before them. In other words, when things are beginning to ripen to a place upon the earth, an event is coming uh, upon the earth, it will in some ways cast its shadow before them. And the same is true of like the judgments that God might bring. Pride is the prelude of destruction, according to this verse. So you can actually use that. I mean, what would be the shadows that we might see? We can use this as a means to evaluate ourselves, our culture, the world we live in. And when you see that, you know, the general run of society, they're getting louder and prouder and rasher and brasher. And there is an attitude, you know, people have a mouth like Goliath to speak great things. And there is a, a lot of hubris in society. And the movements that are in society seem to be characterized by pride and self-will. And people are denying sin. People are forgetting God. People are not respectful of holy things. And you look and you see all these things. You know what that is? It, it's a presage of judgment that is soon to come. It shows that there's an ominous shadow and what comes behind it is the judgment of the Lord. Um, let me just go ahead and quickly just end with something that could, uh, a, a practical point that we can go ahead and take a look at. So a person might say, well then, okay, how about us then? How can we avoid pride and cultivate humility in our own lives, right? I mean, obviously, in that whole 
we want to, we're going to be on that spectrum somewhere, and we want to be as close to Christ-likeness as what we can be. Just practically speaking, what in the world can we do, you know, in order to make sure that we are? And to be honest, one of the things is just regular, honest, brutal self-examination. And, and, and the kind of self-examination where we're not comparing ourselves to the general run of society out there. You know, we can compare ourselves to what the average person in the street is today, but that's not the way we should be comparing ourselves. We should be comparing ourselves to Jesus Christ and to those most godly Christians whom we've seen and read about and know and stack, trying to stack ourselves up about, uh, against them and in being very brutally honest about ourselves. Um, we should also accept the truth of what the Bible says about man because there's a lot of, con you know, different opinions that prevail in the world that, that talk about what man is and what we are to believe about ourselves and about our fellow men. Well, we have to make sure that we consciously reject anything that the world tells us that is in fundamental disagreement with what God says. And then, you know, just basically, I guess we have to remember that ultimately we have absolutely nothing to be proud of. Um, all the good things that we might think we have, they've been given graciously. Um, Paul said this, he said, who, who makes you to differ one from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Well, if you received it, if it was something God gave you, then how can you boast yourself in it as if it weren't something that you just received? And people do it all the time. I mean, the big ones would be like brains, you know. Some people have more brains. Some people have more bucks. Some people have more brawn. Some people have more beauty. Some people, they have a, a skill or an aptitude that has qualified them to really succeed in this world. And these things they use, you know, to their advantage in life. God says, you know, uh, those are things, rather than you glorying in them, you should give thanks to me for them. And uh, so we need to be careful and honest about those things. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, your love upon us. I ask that you would work in hearts according to your own perfect will. We'll give you the thanks and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.